We're going to be continuing today on uh, the series of Revelation that we have been talking about, and we have been dealing with the churches of Revelation. And there's something very important about the churches of Revelation, that you have to understand that the churches of Revelation actually start with a very healthy church. And that's important for you to understand. Jesus leaves, his disciples start the church, and we have a very healthy church that is concentrated on Jesus, preaching the message. But yet, as the churches move on, and as the church of Christ begins to grow, Satan tries to look for ways to destroy the church. Now, I want us to be able to see how Satan tries to destroy the church, but I want us to be able to see also how Satan tries to destroy tries to destroy our lives. So that's why it's important today that, that as we listen to this, again, I'd like to remind you, if, you're, if you have anything else in your mind, just put it away. If you have your phone, put it away, unless we're going to look for something in the Bible. If you have any conversations, just put them away right now. And I want you to listen to this because these are things that are very important. I'm trying to tell you in different ways that Satan is trying to destroy the church and try to destroy us. And it's in these messages to the churches that we find these things. For instance, when we talked about the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus was a church that, that looked very good, had a lot of good things, was a very organized church, but at the same time, Jesus said, it had lost its first love. At first is love. In other words, you can become very religious, you can become very religious, you can become very churchy, but at the same time, not have love for people. Not have love for people. And the thing is that you, you have to understand that, that sometimes I have a hard time when people try to be very religious with me, try to be very Christian with me, yet I do not see them taking time to do something for somebody else. I don't see them taking time to give a Bible study to somebody. I never see them bringing somebody to church. I never see them reaching out to somebody. Everything that they do is very religious, is for themselves. They like to better themselves. They like to do this for themselves. They like to do that for themselves. And what happens, yes, you are very religious. Yes, you sound very good, but you don't have love for people because Christ, although he was... He was kind of a good Christian, don't you think? He was a very good Christian, but he dedicated his life to serve others. You see that? So the church of Ephesus teaches you that you have to be careful that you don't become so religious that you forget other people. That you don't, uh, forget, you're not so into yourself and making yourself better and making yourself perfect that you forget that one of the first things that a Christian has to do is to be able to make a difference for other people. See, a lot of times people don't know, a lot of times people know, don't, people know what they have to do to be saved, right? A lot of times we know what we have to do to be saved, but we don't know what the saved do. Do you get that? We are theologians on what I have to do to be saved, but we don't know what the saved do. When you are saved, there is something for you to do. You, don't, you can't do anything to be saved, but when you are saved, there's something that you do. And sometimes we forget about them. The church of Ephesus taught, that, taught us that. Um, the church of uh, the persecuted church, the church of, uh, of Smyrna, was a church that actually taught us that persecution brings us closer to God. And it taught us that when we are actually closer to God is when we are being persecuted. Because there is something in us, you know, when, that when things are going good, we think we have a handle on everything, and, and, and we sort of push God aside. And it taught us that persecution is something that bring us, brings us close to God. Last week, we talked about a compromising church. And we talked about a compromising church. And, and in there, we, we learned that one of the ways, one of the ways that we actually, uh, uh, that, that Satan 
comes into our lives, that, that Satan comes into the church, that God, Satan comes into us, is when we begin to compromise. And, and we talked about that compromising is when you give something up to get something else that is less than what you expected. Okay? And it talked about the compromising church. So the question a lot of times when we read the book of Revelation is that, is that we can talk about these churches. We can talk about these churches. We can talk about the compromising church. But I like to talk about more about the compromising Christian. And one of the problems that I've always had with the book of Revelation, that I, because I've, I've seen so many series of Revelation, so many sermons on Revelation, and so many people explain Revelation that people get so concentrated on the history in the book of Revelation. They love to show you dates and facts and all these things about the book of Revelation, which makes people feel very, very smart. But, the, but my message when I read the book of Re Revelation is, what is the book of Revelation telling me personally so that when Jesus comes, I can be saved? What is the book of Revelation telling to me as a person? So when you read the church of Pergamos, and, and theologians call it the compromising church, I try to learn from I said, am I a compromising Christian? What am I compromising? And sometimes you have to be careful because little by little we do compromise. We do compromise. And, and like I said, compromising is coming to a solution where you give something up for you to receive something that is less than what you expected. And sometimes we as Christians are okay with that. We know we're not living the right Christian life, but we compromise, and we are okay with that. We do that with our children sometimes, don't we? We compromise with them. We try to make a deal with our kids. And, and, and they're not doing what we want them to do, but we make a deal and we compromise instead of saying, listen, this is what's right and this is the way it is. But we compromise. As parents compromise, we compromise a lot. Why? Because parents are, today are more interested in being their children's friends than being their parents. So we compromise and we give things up. And we give things up. And, and, and then later on, you know what happens? Your children grow up and now their lives are messed up. And then your children are going to come to you and say, why didn't you tell me what was right? Why didn't you make me do what was right? Because here's what happens, people. Children grow up, and they begin to think like adults. And they begin to think like, like adults. Today, we're going to study about the church of Thyatira. It is the, the theologians calling the Bible the corrupt church. Okay, we started with a church who was pure, that Christ started, but Satan went in it in different kinds of ways. And today we're going to see a, a way in which this corrupt church, this corrupt church, how it became corrupt. We're going to open our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18, and we're going to go through that. If you have, uh, if you have your phones with you, your Bibles, I want you to pull them out, whatever you have. Because I want you to mark certain words. I want you to mark certain words in your Bible, which has to do. See, these, one of the things that I find out when I study these churches, there are so many things I can say, there are so many things I can do, that I'm, I'm having to learn to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go at it this way, and I'm going to deal with this subject in it, because there's just so much information in it. Verse 18 uh, because I want you if, you, can, if you can mark things in your Bible, I know if you have a phone, if you have an iPad, where you have your Bible, there, there's things that you can mark, uh, you can outline, and things like that. And I want you to do that with certain words. Verse 18 says, And the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says who? Are you guys here with me? The Son of God. Okay, I know you're, some of you might be looking at me but thinking about something else. I want you to come home, okay? It says, And the angel of Thyatira write, These things says the who? 
the Son of God, who has eyes like what? Like a flame of fire, and his feet like what? Like fine brass. And Jesus says here, verse 19, says, I know your works, love, service, and faith. I know your love. So this church has what? Has love, has faith, and has what? And has service. And not only that, in fact, says, and your, and your, and your patience, and as for your works, the last ones were more than the first. So here you have a church that has love, has faith, has what else? has service, and it's even patient. I mean, does that look, seem like some of us? I mean, we might have love. And, and this is important for us to see. And we, and we love people. We love our brothers and sisters here. We love each other. And we have faith. Don't we have faith? We have faith. We believe that Jesus is coming. We believe in God. We've never seen God, yet we believe in him. That is called faith. We know that God is going to act for us. We have faith. If someone is sick, we know that God can do something. We have faith. Do we have faith or not? Don't we have faith? Yes, we do. We have faith. Do we have love? Yes, we do love some people. So we do have some love, right? We, we, lo we love some so, people. So, and do we have service? Yes, we like to help out some people, you know, in, in, in one moment or another. I'm trying to describe here, people, the general Christian. Do you, do you get where I'm coming from? I'm trying to describe the general Christians who we do basic things. And it's important for you to understand that. It's explaining here the basic Christian. And in fact, we are patient. Why? Because we keep coming to church, right? Our life is imperfect, but what would we do? We still keep coming. And we know as we look at our own personal lives that we're not everything that God wants us to be. But, but, but we, we, we keep coming. We keep praying. We keep listening to sermons. We still keep hoping that something is going to change us. And know your, your patience as for your works, the last or more than the, the, than the first. Then look at verse 20. It says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you, it says, allow, and some of your Bibles might say tolerate. Anybody have tolerate? Okay, and I want you to underline that word tolerate. Tolerate, because that word is very important for this church here. It says, if this is a church, if, if the church of Pergamum, uh, Pergamum was a church that compromised, the church of, 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 uh, of, Smyr, of, of uh, Thyatira is a, is a church that tolerates, allows. And I want you to remember that. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce. And I want you to, to underline that word also, seduce. Allows, tolerates, seduce. Servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And as we look at this word, I want to, and, and let's go through the whole thing. Verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Now, it says, listen, if this church doesn't get better, I'm going to throw her into a great tribulation. And we're going to go here in the book of Revelation a time of tribulation that the church went through, okay, into a great tribulation. Verse 23, and I will kill her children with death, with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he, and I want you to underline that part too, I am he who searches the minds and the what? And the hearts. First we suck, we, we, we talked about tolerate, being seduced. And then here Jesus introduces himself as saying, listen, I am the one who searches the minds and the hearts. And I'm, I'm trying to put something here together. First of all, we're looking about a church who looks good. A church who has faith. A church who loves 
a church who does service, but a church that also does what? Tolerates. Hmm. A Christian who loves, a Christian who has faith, a Christian who tries to help other people, but then is a, is a Christian who tolerates. And now Jesus, he comes here and says, listen, listen, I want you to know that who I am, I am the one who, I am he who searches the minds and the what? And the hearts. Now to you I say to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine who have not been known the, the depths of Satan. See, people, when I, when I see this, I see something that looks good, a Christian who acts good, apparently does good, has faith, but is tolerant of certain things in their life. And here it is talking about a Jesus who says, I am one who searches the minds and the hearts, and what Jesus is trying to tell us through this, listen, I am God, and you can act whichever way you want. You can talk all these things, but I am, I am interested in your heart and in your mind. And here, Jesus, what he does, he goes deeper than our actions. And he wants to know, and he wants to tell us that the, as a church, that listen, church, I'm glad you have faith. I'm glad you believe in me. I'm glad you come to church. I am glad you do community service. But I am the one who searches the minds and the hearts. And Jesus' question is, how is your mind and how is your heart? How is your mind and how is your heart? How is the part that the pastor can't see? How is the part that no one knows about? How is the part when you're at home alone and no one's there? How is the part when you are somewhere that nobody knows that you're even a Christian? And here Jesus is saying, listen, the problem with this church of Thyatira, it is, a problem, it is not a problem of appearance. It is problem deep because it talks about they have not given up to the deep things of Satan. In other words, he is talking about that the problem with this church is deep down inside. It's deep inside. And the problems with people as you and I as Christians who have the same problem is that it's not how we look because we look good. We talk nice. We dress well. But Jesus is saying, listen, hold up. You have a problem, and I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And the problem that you have is not what people see. Your problem is in places that no human being can see, only I can see. And if you don't change that, I will destroy you. And if you don't change that, I will destroy you. Here's where the problem is. I would like to go back to verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow. You know, we, we, we permit certain things. To tolerate is to allow the existence. To tolerate means allow the existence, occurrence, or practice of something that one does not necessarily like or agree with without interference. When we allow in our Christian life, when we allow something to come into our life that we do not agree with, when we allow something to come into our life that we know that isn't right, when we allow something that we know that God doesn't agree with, we tolerate that, and, and maybe, maybe no one else knows about it. As Christians, we may be trying the best we can, 
but the problem is the things that we are tolerating in our lives that are eating us up. The things that we are tolerating. See, the things that you are tolerating are the things that, that in, in your, the Spirit talks to you and says, you know that this is wrong, but we excuse it, we tolerate it, we allow it in our homes, we allow it in our lives, we allow it to our children, we allow it within our own personal lives on, on what is it that we see on the computer, what is it that we do, which are things that we know that are wrong, but we, we tolerate them. And these are things that begin to eat us from the inside. Nobody knows about it. Only God and us. But we tolerate it. The things that you tolerate, the things that you know that are wrong and continue doing them, and Jesus is saying, listen, the problem with this church, it is a church that, that looks good, but you are tolerating things in your life. You are tolerating things within the church that are destroying the church from within. But at the same time, the message is for us as, as Christians. You are tolerating things that you yourself don't agree with, but you're tolerating them. And as you tolerate them, they begin to be part of your character. They, beca they begin to be part of who you are. And the lesson here that we need to learn is, what is it that you are tolerating in your life? What are the things that you are allowing in your life that you know should not exist, but yet you tolerate them, you accept them, and you allow them into your life, and without you knowing, they are changing who you are. They are changing who you are. They are changing your relationship with God. They are changing what you think of God, and they are changing your character. They are changing everything about you because Jesus says, listen, the church must understand. And, and, and he's trying to get us to understand that he says, I am he. I am he who searches the mind and searches the heart. And he's reminded the church of Thyatira that it's not about what you look like. Too much emphasis is put on what we do and what we look like, and not enough emphasis is put on who we are. And this is a problem today of the church, that we try to have tolerance. Sometimes we think we love more than God. And we tolerate this and we tolerate that without knowing that that's destroying our church from within. When we tolerate sin. I'm not talking about hating people or pushing people out, but we need to tell people what's wrong is wrong. Yes, our church is welcome. You can come here. We accept anybody and everybody, and we know you're struggling with sin, but the sin that you're committing is still wrong, and it's not okay. That is not okay. It doesn't matter in what situation you're in, committing sin, living a life of sin, it is not okay. So we as a church, we can't become a church that just tolerates things because it would eat us from within. We can also become people ourselves as individuals who tolerate things within our lives. Why do this? I know it's wrong, but, but I continue. You're tolerating. You're allowing that to enter into your life. Most of the things that you tolerate today, you're going to come to regret later. As Christians, we may be trying our best we can. Uh, 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 as Christians, we may be trying the best we can, but the problem is the things that we are tolerating in our lives, they are eating us up. See, when you, when you tolerate things deep in you, they change you. And those things become your God. Now remember, these are gods that are made of wood and stone. Here's what happens, people. We have things in our lives that really become our gods. 
They've really become our gods. Sometimes success can become your God. Money can become your God. And you say, no, 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 I don't, I don't trust in money. I, I, I trust in God. No, 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 no. God really, money really is your God. Money really is your God. You, and now that money, that God that you have that is money, that represents a God that is made of wood and stone that can't do anything for you. But you do believe in the real God, but you use the real God to bless your false God. And we have these gods in our life that are called success, money, fame. Those are your real gods. Although they're made of wood and stone. And they can't do anything for you. But you do believe in Jehovah God. You know why you believe in him? So that he can help you reach and get your real God. The God you really had loved. So you got to be careful that success isn't the God you really worship. And the real God, you're only using him to reach the God you worship. But those gods come into our lives because we tolerate them. We tolerate them. And we bring them in. It could be money. It could be sex. It could be sex. It could be success. It could be sports. Our young people are so attracted today by, by the sports mentality of these guys that we see out there on TV. And we don't know that those that we you see on TV are probably one out of 3,000 that really make it anywhere. But we are so enamored by them being on TV we're so enamored by the Ferraris they drive. We're so into that, that that, for, for a lot of young people who have a lot of capability or some capability in sports, they think that everyone is going to make it. You know, and, and, I, and, I, and this subject is so important to me because I've always been in so much into sports, uh, uh, you know, from, you know, from a, ch a child. And, 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 and that is something that it seems so attractive to our young people. And they put so much in into that, that that really becomes their God. And then they come to church and ask God, the real God, to bless them so that, they're, so that they can worship their, 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 their God that is really made of stone and clay, but that's the God they really worship. And the real God that's in heaven that is alive, he's the one that they use. So hopefully he can help me become famous one day because that's your real God. And that's what drives them, and that's what moves them. What is it that moves you? Is it being successful? The things that we have in our hearts. See, the problem that Jesus is trying to teach us through this church is that the problem that, that we have is not really the way we, we, we act. It might not be the way we act. It might not be the things that we do, but it is, it is what we think. It is what is in our hearts. When you go and you see in the book of Psalms, in the books of Psalms, uh, chapter 51, Psalm 51, verse 6, you know, when, 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 when David had sinned and he had committed adultery, and because of his adultery, he even murdered somebody to try to cover it up, he came before God. And he says, Behold, you desire truth where in the inward were parts. And in the hidden parts, you will make me no wisdom. Because David recognized that his problem was not in who he looked like or he acted because he looked like a king. And the king was the anointed one. So people treated him like a king. And David finally found out to say, if he only knew. <laughs> If you only knew the adultery in my heart. And he said, no, 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 God. No, God. Don't bless me anymore in what I do and what I look like. Heal me 
where no one sees. Heal me where no one sees. And as Christians today, we need to be healed. Not where the world can see. We need to be healed in our most secret places of our lives is where we need to be healed. And when we look, not at what man sees, but we look at what God sees. We need to come before him and say, God, heal me. In the deepest parts of me, in verse 10, the same Psalm 51.10, the Psalm says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew steadfast Spirit within me. Give me a new heart, God. Not a new pair of clothes. Not how I look. See, David gave up on that. He was tired of it because, oh, he was, he was glorified because he killed Goliath. He was a great warrior. He, was his, he, bought, he fought against the, 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 the most biggest Nations in his time, he was, he was strong, but he found out that within himself, he was weak. He was weak. He acted strong. He talked strong. He talked like language, like he had it all together. You know, you know what I say? Sometimes we talk like we got it all together. And David said, no, God, no more. No more, God. You know you know what a mess I am. I, I fought against Goliath. I fought against Goliath. And yet I gave in to temptation and adultery. That's the real me. I have many victories, many physical victories, but I have failed in the secret victories. When Jesus tells us Thyatira, listen, I am the one who reads the hearts and the minds. It's telling Thyatira, Thyatira, stop playing the game. The reason why you are corrupt is because you have things deep within you that are destroying you. You look good, but ultimately you will destroy yourselves because those things within you will finally come up to the surface and eat you up as a human being. Now God says, this is what I know of you and think of you as you are inside. But one day they will eat, begin to eat you and come up little by little, and ultimately they will consume the outer part of you, and others will also see how dirty you are. And this is the message of Thyatira, the one who's talking to you. And I think that message, we need to hear it today. That the one who's talking to us, that what Christianity is all about, is not about what the world thinks. It's not about what the pastor thinks. It's not about what the church thinks. It's about what God thinks. And he says, listen, the one who's talking to you is the one who knows the deepest secrets of your life. Stop trying to hide it. And give that part to me. And give that part to me. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, people, you can stop doing things. You can change your actions. You can change the way you do things. But in Christianity, this is why salvation can only come from God. Because human beings alone that are disciplined, you have human beings that are very disciplined in their life. 
and they act right, do right, do things. But the change of the heart is something that only God can do. And the problem is that some people forget about that because they have grown up in, in a family that has given them a strong character, good discipline, and they've, and they've covered all their bases in a way that in the world and to the world, they look great. But the problem that is within the heart, the diseases, the problems that because of sin have come into our lives from a child have been there. We don't pay attention to them and they begin to grow and we tolerate them. You get my point in this. We tolerate them. You know why we tolerate them? Because we forget that we serve a God who reads the minds and the hearts. And my God is not Jesus anymore. My God is people, what they think of me. And as long as people think good of me, I'm okay. And we lose fear of the one who can read the minds and the hearts. And the one who reads the minds and the hearts is not important to us anymore. Our real God. Our people, our real God is society. Our real God is what others think of us, and we forget that the real, real God is the one who could read the minds and the hearts. But you see, that part of the body, that part of humanity can only be changed, can only be changed by God himself. Salvation is from within. We have made a mistake when we have taught people that salvation is about changing your actions. So therefore, when people change certain actions, they don't change their beliefs. They don't change their worldview. They don't change what's in the heart. That stays the same. They change this, their actions. But God is saying, no, the problem of Thyatira and the problem of Christians who are in the situation of Thyatira is that their insides have not been saved. Their mind has not been saved. Their heart has not been saved. The heart and the mind is still in the dumps. They are allowing certain things to penetrate their inner life. They have tolerated, tolerated certain things in their life. And they have been seduced by Satan. Now here he uses a woman named Jezebel. Jezebel in the Old Testament, in the, King, in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, you will find her in 1 Kings chapter 17, chapter 18. Jezebel uh, was uh, the daughter of a Phoenician king. And Jezebel married Ahab, who was the king of Israelites. And as she married Ahab, she brought with her her gods, which was Baal. And she began to, to say, you know, uh, I'm, you know uh, Ahab, you have your God. Uh, I have my God. You need to be tolerant of my God, because we need to, you know, we need to get along. See, getting along, getting along to, to Ahab became more important than obeying God. So who became his God? Jezebel became his God. And, and he tolerated it. And, and first, you know, she probably bought, you know, a little bail, you know. You know, I just want a little bail in my room. You know, because that's, that's my, my, my little God, you know. You know you, and, and, and he became tolerant. And, 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 he, and he tolerated that little God. And then she said, she said you know, you know my, my bail is so good, you know. I like to have, you know, a big one here at the door. And he says, honey, you know, honey, as long as you're happy, honey. You know, and he tolerated the Baal there. And then, and then what did Jezebel do? Jezebel started teaching her servants, you know, Baal is a wonderful God. He, he is a God who, 
for our, our, our fertility. He is the God. And they begin to think about that God. And now their servants had a little God in their house too. And, and without, and because he tolerated that, Baal would became part of all Israel. And you could find Baal everywhere. And the people of God began to worship Baal. And what happened in the, in the Christian church was exactly the same thing. The Christian church came in. We talked to you last week about Constantine. Constantine became a Christian. Constantine, and now the, the Christianity became the, 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 the religion of the, of, the, of the empire. And now they start bringing in other people from different nationalities, these tribes that they would, that they would overcome in war, and they would bring them in. And these tribes came in with their gods, and their tribes came in with their, with their customs, and they came in with, the, with their sun worshiping. We know, you know, and, and, and the day of worship was changed. We talked about that last week. And, 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 and you, know, hey, you know, as long as you worship God, it's okay. It really doesn't matter. And then the real Sabbath got changed into, in, 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 into, into the day of the sun, and, and, and the church began to worship, and, and, and it began to mix in. See, at, at last week we, we talk, talked a lot about Balaam. And, and if you see that Balaam, Balaam, he had... He with spiritualism and he was a spiritual le leader and then he came together with with Balak remember Balak right Balak he was the king he, he was the king uh, uh, of, of the Moabites and so here you see spiritualism I mean devil worship spiritualism getting together with this with this powerful king okay and and and, and they come together to persecute God's people to persecute God you know we you know you know God God's people. And, and here in the book of Revelation, you, you find that spiritualism, spiritualism got mixed up with Christianity and they come together and they will also persecute God's people. In the church of Thyatira, it talks about how, how these things are permeating into the church from within. Why? Because they were being tolerated. They were being tolerated. And right now, when you look at, at Catholicism, Catholicism is a straight-up mixture of spiritualism with Christianity. And just as in the book of Elijah, Jezebel, representing spiritualism, comes together with a political power, Ahab, to persecute God's people, just as in Balaam, spiritualism comes together with a political power to persecute God's people. In the book of Revelation, spiritualism from the heathen nations comes together with, with, the, with the papacy, comes together with a political power to persecute God's people. How does this all happen? And you will see the same pattern and people, the same pattern, if you're wise and you look, is beginning to happen right now. Right before our eyes. Where spiritualist, spiritualism, Christianity, that mix coming together to come together with political powers to ultimately persecute God's people. And this, is happens, this happens from the church of Thyatira when begin to allow, tolerate things in their lives. But sometimes we can get stuck on that history and we can get stuck on, on looking at other people and other church, churches. I believe, people, that if we take this message to heart and we apply it to our own lives, it doesn't matter what happens later on, we will be in heaven when Jesus comes. But sometimes we can know so much about history, and we can know so much about that part, that we forget that this is also a personal message to us. We have to be careful that we are not being seduced. That we are not being seduced. That we're not being seduced by some sort of Jezebel in our own lives. And that seduction is not outwardly. 
The seduction can be inwardly. And we don't worry about it because it's just outwardly. But here it says, be careful of your minds. Be careful of your hearts. And that is something that you must turn over to God. Because if you have something within you that no one else knows other than God, and you allow it, and you tolerate it, it will begin to eat you up from within. And one day, it will explode out. And one day, not only God will know, everyone will know. Not only God. And that is the sin of Thyatira. A sin from within. A sin from within that is killing the church, that is killing them. And the message to us today is the same. Be careful of the sin from within. You read verse 24. It says, Now to you I say and to the rest of Thyatira, as many do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depth of Satan. Looks like the other church have known the depth of Satan. It is something deep. It is something down deep that no one else can really see unless you have spiritual eyes. The, the book, uh, Paul also talks about the deep things of God. The deep things of God. How deep? How deep has God penetrated into your life? I want you to think about it. How deep has God penetrated into your life? Is it only so deep? Or are there parts in your life that God has not penetrated yet? And it's only so deep. And David gave up on that. And he said, no, God. It's not, about, it's not about being shallow. It says, behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. Are those inward parts, do they belong to God? We must turn them over to God. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Create in me a clean heart. It's not just about clean actions. It's not about looking good. It's about being good. And being good is something that only God can do. And I will take away your heart of stone. And I will give you a, a heart of flesh. That is something that only God can do. And I will put my laws in your heart. And I will teach you to obey me. Oh, don't you want that? But you see, for God to put his heart, his law in our hearts, our own desires and laws must leave. That's that part, that inward part. That is the part that God wants. And a lot of times that is the last part given to God. We give him our actions, we give him our looks, we give him what people can see. But the inward part, that's the part we need to give to God. The message with Thyatira was an inward problem. Was an inward problem. Problem from within. We have to ask God today that that may not be our problem. If it is, it's because we have tolerated, like Thyatira did, they tolerated certain things in, in, our, in our lives. We have tolerated certain things, and we keep tolerating them, knowing that they're wrong, but we keep tolerating them. And they eat us up from within. Little by little, they're eating us up from within. They're destroying your faith in God. They're destroying your view of God. 
They're destroying how you see God. They're destroying how you see the church. They're destroying how you see the word, those things that we are tolerating from within. One of the great things I, one of the things you notice as a pastor that sometimes you visit people and, and, they, and they start talking about the church and the church and the church is so bad, the church a bunch of hypocrites and the church this and the church is that and the church is that. And inside, you know what I'm asking myself? What's eating you up inside? What's eating you up inside that you're trying to look good by making others look bad? There's something I know, something is eating you up inside. You're tolerating things in your life and that's coming into your life and it's, and, it's, and, it's make, and it's changing your actions and it's changing how you view God, how you view the church, how you view other people. What are we tolerating? What are we tolerating from within that's changing us completely and how we view God? And Jesus says, to the church of Thyatira, he said in verse 23, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. In other words, we're dealing with a God, but that's the part that he wants. He wants our hearts. He says, I want your heart. I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm tired of your actions. They don't mean anything to me. I'm one you from within. And that is the hardest part. That is as Christians sometimes to give up, to give in, and let God in within the deepest parts of our lives. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us to be your children. And sometimes, Lord, we, we believe. We have faith. We serve. And we keep coming to church. And we are persistent and we're still here. And thank you, God, that we can do that. But yet there is something hidden within our hearts that we still don't give up to you. And we know, we need to know that you are the God who searches the minds and he searches the hearts. And it's so incredible how you know what nobody knows about us. You know what no one knows about us. But yet you love us. How great and powerful you are. And today we thank you for that. But Lord, we want to take that within us. As you today here are with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Can you think of something you haven't turned over to God? And if you have something you haven't turned over to God, or you want to say, God, come into the deepest parts of my life where I have not allowed you before, and save me from within. Thank you for saving me from without because I act and look like a really good Christian. But today I want you to save me from within. Save my thoughts. Save my feelings. Save my flesh. That it may become a place where you are welcome to abide in. If that is your feeling today, I ask wherever you're at it, just raise your hand and say, God, I turn that over to you. I turn the deepest parts of my life to you so that you may put your throne 
in the deepest parts of my life. So Lord, those who have raised their hands today, you know what they're turning over to you. You know what they're giving to you. Bless them. Forgive them. And give them the strength that they need to be transformed. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.